was a banner day for Evansville. One of America's best known writers was set to appear at Trinity United Methodist Church. <clears throat> Carl Sandburg, known up to 1927 as a lecturer, poet, and writer of children's stories, had attained international stature with the publication a year earlier of Abraham Lincoln's The Prairie Years. Given the connection of Lincoln to Spencer, uh, Spencer County, Indiana, and Sandburg's immediate prominence as the country's most notable expert on Lincoln, there was no question that space in the historic church, built coincidentally when Lincoln was president, would be at a premium. Sandburg's February speech was the second of four planned events in the city. January marked the appearance of Ilya Tolstoy, son of the famed Russian novelist. Two more speakers, less known than Tolstoy or Sandberg, were scheduled, one for March and the other in April. There was no question that given his notoriety, Sandberg was the prize catch. As the estimated 500 disappointed auditors could testify, given that they were turned away at the door. One of the lucky ones who made it into the church was a local attorney who firmly ensconced in his retirement years, hastened by his increasing deafness, was as prominent locally as Sandberg was nationally. Yet by the time Sandberg met him, Johnny Eigelhart had already corresponded with and offered assistance to numerous well-known Lincoln historians and biographers throughout the country. Although the correspondence was small compared to many, Idleheart wrote, uh, to many that Idleheart wrote to, Idleheart made a deep impression on Sandberg. Proof of this is this picture, which Sandberg asked Idleheart to have taken. Because Sandberg <laughs> felt that Idleheart bore a striking resemblance to Walt Whitman, with whom Sandberg had been compared since he began to see success as a poet nearly 10 years before. While Johnny Idleheart is little known to most people in or outside of the Evansville community today, he is enjoying something of a renaissance since the publication in 2012 of Keith Erickson's doctoral dissertation, Everybody's History, excuse me, Everybody's History, and most recently with the publication of Age Youth by William Bartell and Joshua Claiborne. Both books approach Idleheart from different perspectives. Bartell and Claiborne reprint some of the more important papers that were presented during the heyday of the Southwestern Indiana Historical Society, which flourished from the early 1920s to the late 1930s under the initial leadership of Idleheart. Given that the majority of papers never achieved publication in either popular or academic outlets, this is a vital service to historians and the reading public. Erickson, however, sees Idleheart and the Southwestern Indiana Historical Society in a contrasting way. He gives a history of the group and its members, combining narrative and analysis, and is more closely tied to the traditional path of most historians. All sides of the story are told, including aspects that many might consider less than positive toward members. Although none of the negative aspects of the story really reflect badly on anyone, uncovering feuds between members adds a perspective that results in a more human approach to any history. This warts and all approach is disturbing to many in a community, which is one of the reasons local history has so many detractors. Returning for a moment to Whitman, he once said that the sweetest meat is that which clings to our own bones. The journalist and historian Lewis Mumford used Whitman to correctly note that local history meant much more to a community, community because the matter how insignificant an area may be compared to its geographic neighbors, the essence of history is the drama of a community's life. That local history would find an audience just about anywhere people gather makes sense. But given what some see as its numerous flaws, Local history would have to come up a few notches to be even be considered the redheaded stepchild in the historical field. Before delving into what exactly lured John Eichelhardt into local history, 
it's important to establish some terminology. At first blush, it seems simple. Local history is the history of a local area. And that certainly holds true to a point. There are a number of side streets in that definition that one can go down. For example, one of the most prominent types of local history is the historical society, or in our case, the genealogical society, which is organized by a group in order to promote and keep the history of an area relevant to all who live there. It's generally made up of the local citizenry, most of whom hold jobs outside of the historical profession. They may present papers among themselves, and sometimes those papers do achieve publication in historical journals. But that is rare, especially for smaller organizations. Historical societies in places such as Boston, Washington, D.C., and other major urban outlets are exceptions to this rule. Another example would be a group of people who operate a single or a number, or excuse, yeah, a number of historical sites, often in conjunction with the historical society, which provides a three-dimensional picture of the history that was prevalent in an area. The organizational leader or curator is often someone with an academic background in historical administration. But again, for smaller communities, it often is a volunteer with a deep and abiding interest in history. Finally, another form would be individuals who, while not organized in a society or operating a museum, study local history out of personal interest. They may or may not produce anything in a tangible way, but their work remains of great interest to their fellow citizens and others, and often, excuse me, and often after their death, their work receives the appreciation it deserves. An example of this would be an individual who collects local obituaries from newspapers and then puts them into binders. Local history is often sneered at, especially by academic historians who only see amateurs in the aforementioned ranks. Charges of boosterism, a lack of seriousness, or utilization of accepted methodologies, and conspiratorial actions designed to suppress negative information has plagued many local historians and not without some justification. While often accused, as one academic historian did around the turn of the 20th century, of being mere antiquarianism, there can be little doubt that local history, when done with a desire to tell the whole unvarnished truth using proper methodology, is the foundation of a larger, more comprehensive national picture and can even bring to light stories with national relevance that were long forgotten. I have personal experience on this point. Well, you saw a house. <laughs> uh, in the early 1990s, while working on the Carmine Times newspaper, I felt an urging to return to the study of history that I had planned to do since graduating from Eastern Illinois University in 1985. I had no idea how I would accomplish this, but a chance encounter showed me the way. I had been assigned to do a story on a local artistic couple who lived in one of the early homes of the community, which you saw very quickly. Chauncey L. Conger was a local attorney and state legislator who was a prominent local citizen. While taking a tour of the home, I noticed a picture of Chauncey in the hallway. My first thought was to research his life and then write a column. In doing the research for what would have been of strictly local interest, I changed course when I remembered that Chauncey's brother Everton had played a role in the capture of John Wilkes Booth. Realizing that there was very little accurate information on his life, my focus soon turned to Everton. From that point, I produced a five-part series on Everton's life that eventually led me to be selected, among others, to participate in a documentary in 2007 that appeared on the National Geographic Channel. While I can claim very little of the credit, Everton's story <coughs> is now recognized as a part of the national conversation about Lincoln, although his name still isn't as prominent as it should be. <coughs> Local history, by its very nature, 
is of concern mainly to a local community. And it's often created by a president's either native or transplant. What attracts someone to study their community is as different as those who approach it. Some are interested in a community based on a long-standing fascination. Others approach it on a more personal level, such as living in a home that has a historical reputation or purchasing a business that has a long history. Many are interested because of the connections related to the community, such as the local church, congregation, or service organization. What drew John Iglehart to the study of local history, and through that, the early life of Abraham Lincoln, was a desire to set the record straight about the area he had been born in, and his father, Asa, and grandfather, Levi, had moved to and made their home. Just what he would be up against was set early when two of the most controversial biographers of Lincoln made their appearance. When Lincoln's last law partner, William Herndon, who deplored the hagiography written about Lincoln since the president's death, came out with his biography, what set his work apart from, an early, from earlier writers was the time he spent in southwestern Indiana. The late Rodney O. Davis, Lincoln Scholar from Knox College in Galesburg, wrote of Herndon's trip to Spencer County in 1865 that it afforded Herndon some of the most memorable moments of all his Lincoln researches. Davis also noted that Nathaniel Grigsby and Daniel Turman both painted Herndon a picture of Spencer County as wild and untamed. The rude character of life in early Spencer County was a constant undertone in most of Turnham's recollections, Davis wrote. Although discrepancies abounded in what Herndon's informants told him, all agreed Mr. Lincoln laid the foundation of his character in Spencer County, Indiana. <clears throat> Had Herndon not made the trip in 1865, much of what we know about Lincoln's early life would have died with his informants. But just as important, the trip also provided an important stimulus for Herndon's description of what Lincoln faced. As Davis notes, Herndon's developing strong impression of the primitive and frequently violent character of Lincoln's early social environment must also have been affected by the still undeveloped nature of the Spencer County that he saw, a region, as David Donald had said, almost as backwoodsy in 1865 as when the Lincolns had migrated from Kentucky. Davis added, the population was rough and mostly semi-literate at best, but Abraham Lincoln had been able to thrive in it partly because he could take care of himself physically. Herndon, so proficient in collecting reminiscences from his informants, found the task of writing a book too onerous. It fell to a young admirer of his by the name of Jesse White to bring the material into print. Before Herndon and White's volumes appeared, however, Herndon, in desperate need of cash in 1869, sold Ward Hill Lehman a copy that he had made of his Lincoln record. Lehman, who knew Lincoln from their days of practicing law on Illinois' State Judicial Circuit, and whom Lincoln later appointed U.S. Marshal to the District of Columbia, collaborated with Chauncey F. Black on a biography of Lincoln. Black, a Democrat, did most of the work while Lehman, the Republican, got the credit. What set both Lehman's book and the later work from Herndon and White apart from the predecessors was their focus on the necessity of Lincoln overcoming the life he had experienced during the Indiana years in order to achieve his best and greatest. It is our duty, Black told Lehman, to show the world the majesty and beauty of his character as it grew by itself and unassisted out of this unpromising soil. We must point mankind to the diamond glowing on the dung hill, and then to the same resplendent jewel in the future setting of great success and <coughs> brilliant achievements. Herndon and White declared that Lincoln's greatness lay in his ability to rise above his early circumstances. Many of our great men and our statesmen it is true, have been self-made, rising gradually through your struggles in the, to the topmost round of the ladder. But Lincoln rose from a lower depth than any of them, from a stagnant, putrid pool 
like the gas which set on fire by its own energy and self-combustible nature rises in jets, blazing clear and bright. I should be remiss in my duty if I did not throw the light on this part of the picture so that the world may realize what marvelous contrast one phase of his life presents to another. Many people accepted but what both Herndon and Black and Lehman had to say about the wilds of Spencer County. Our view of the frontier distilled in our minds from Hollywood movies and before that dime novels and other media give us a rough and tumble picture of what life was like. Yet one group of people, and more importantly, one person, would have none of it. John Eugene Eichhorn <laughs> was born August 10, 1848, in what he described as the wilderness of Ward County, to Asa and Ann Cal Eichelhardt. John's grandfather, Levi, came to the region from Anne Arundel County, Maryland, in 1815, moving to Ohio County, Kentucky. Later, the family, including John's father, Asa, eventually moved to Ward County, where Asa became a farmer and started to read the law. Admitted to the Indiana Bar at the age of 32, he moved to Evansville in 1848, where he became a prominent lawyer and judge. John Michael Hart graduated from Asbury University, which is now DePaul University, in 1868, and followed his father into the practice of law. <coughs> Eichelhardt achieved great professional success working for the Evansville and Terracote Railroad Company. In his later years, unable to work because of increasing deadness, Eichelhardt became interested in local history. In 1916, Evansville Mayor Benjamin Bossy appointed a committee to plan the 1917 celebration of the centennial of Evansville's 1817 incorporation and to publish a history of the city's pioneer families. This work appealed to me, and I selected a list of over 300 such names representing nearly all the original families in the community, I call her for Paul Blaker. The outbreak of World War I abruptly, abruptly halted the centennial plans, but left the group with a large collection of historical papers and valuable documents. I call her one of the documents turned over to a more permanent organization, hence the organization of the Southwestern Indiana Historical Society. The interest of the group later grew as it closely began to focus more and more on the life of Lincoln. Hence, the group also later became known as the Lincoln Inquiry. Initially, Eichelhardt viewed the work of the society as much broader than the study of Lincoln. In 1922, Eichelhardt delivered a speech recalling the comments he'd made in the 1920 presidential inaugural address that he had made. Eichelhardt warned those members in 1920 against the overshadowing influence of that inquiry, meaning Lincoln over our other work. I believed then that it was in danger of usurping more than a proper share of our efforts. However, in 1922, he admitted, on that point, I have changed my mind. Eichelhardt determined that before historians could write confidently on Lincoln's Indiana years, the group must supply the missing chapter of Indiana life, that of its pioneer stock. When we have supplied the latter, which we hope to do, we will, I think, have furnished the facts from which the competent historian will in a measure supply the former. Eichelhardt classified three levels of pioneer stock. At the highest level, he described a class that included clergy, professional men such as lawyers and doctors, and men in public life who held public office first when Indiana was the territory and later a state. The testimony of contemporary writers is direct and conclusive to the point that there was of this class a very substantial number of people, I call point. Immediately below this group was a middle class, made up of otherwise intelligent people who were born in the wilderness and therefore had little opportunity for formal education, but who did all they could to educate themselves. Eichelhardt believed Indiana professor, University Professor Logan Essary captured the spirit of this class very well in an article he had written for the Indiana Magazine of History called The Pioneer Aristocracy. Essary wrote, in 
politics, they were Jacksonian Democrats, loud and boastful. In religion, they were old-fashioned Baptists and shouting Methodists with a fair sprinkle of Dunkards, Quakers, and Presbyterians, all patrons of the camp meeting. In language, they excelled in the picturesque lingua of the Ohio Valley, for which that reason has become known as the Hoosier dialect. He continued, they were strong for education, a smattering of the three yards, provided it stopped short of book learning. This group, I heart claim, made up the world <coughs> The bottom layer was made up of those on the lowest stratum of moral, social, and intellectual life, who were largely illiterate and included a rowdy, vicious, and lawless element. <laughs> to focus on this lowest class of resident, as representative of the pioneer whole, proved to Idlehart that the New England intellectuals and their fellow travelers in the Hoosier State would never see southwestern Indiana as the developer of Lincoln's greatness, but rather as a quiet mind that he was forced to rise above. Such embedded opinion provoked Idlehart to fight all that much harder to prove his point. Undoubtedly and vociferously partisan in his outlook, Idlehart had harsh words for a number of the better known Lincoln biographers who, in his mind, continued to slander the region in the same fashion as Herndon and Lane. He told one correspondent, my blood has been boiling more or less these 13 years over the treatment of the New England intellectuals of things Western. Noting that those writers' interpretation were borrowing a phrase from one of his correspondents, like the play of Hamlet with Hamlet left out. There were numerous historians whom Idlehart respected, and two of the most prominent were Frederick Jackson Turner and Ida M. Tarver. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Idlehart thoroughly loathed Indiana Senator Albert J. Beveridge. Idlehart was a strong proponent of Turner's work on the frontier. Turner's frontier thesis was first introduced at the Chicago World's Fair in 1895 in a meeting of the nascent American Historical Association. Put simply, America's Western uh, put simply, American democracy developed not due to Puritan influences, but rather from America's Western expansion. Self-reliance increased as one entered what was generally unsettled territory. The frontier was a great equalizer in that anyone could settle in an area and go as far as their talents would take them. If someone failed, he was free to pick up and move to another location where no one would know of his failure. This was termed the safety valve in the frontier. As people move further inland, away from settled territory, they also move further away from European influences and develop purely American traditions. To be sure, European influences were made a factor, but it was diluted by those frontier settlers. Calling Turner the greatest authority on our frontier life west of the mountains, Idlehart expressed surprise that it took a Midwesterner to correctly interpret the significance that the frontier had on American democracy. Is it true that a Western man is the first to truly interpret the frontier life in American history? I found it to be true, Idlehart said in 1922. I quote a Western man because you cannot find the facts among the writings of the Eastern historians. <clears throat> In very few of the Eastern colleges is any attention given to Western history. And when any such attention is given, it is merely given as a concession to sentiment. On this point, Turner gently chastised Idlehart, noting that since he first introduced the frontier thesis in 1895, the number of Western focus historians many of whom were trained by Turner, had increased, especially on the East Coast. Idlehart and Turner corresponded for several years. While Turner's theory now has more detractors than supporters, at the time of their correspondence, the frontier thesis was largely accepted in both academic circles and in popular journalism. Just to give you a little aside, when I was in college in, in the 1980s, the frontier thesis still held its way, at least where I went to college. That's how popular it was. 
Turner encouraged Idle Heart and the Southwestern Indiana Historical Society <clears throat> to continue working to uncover the positive influences that the frontier had on Lincoln and not to be demoralized by those who continue to see the frontier only in its rightest form. Probably the most supportive, not only of Idle Heart, but of the Southwestern Indiana Historical Society and its mission was Ida Tarbell. Best known today for her expose on John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Corporation, Tarbell's earlier series on Lincoln, first covering the early years and later his presidential years, doubled the number of subscribers of McClure's magazine when the work appeared in the turn of the 20th century. When Tarbell's Lincoln appeared in McClure pages, gone was any talk of stunned hills or stagnant putrid pools. Things were rough, certainly. But while Lincoln and his father had no beaten highways through the forts, Tarbell wrote, to a boy of seven years, free from all responsibility and too vigorous to feel its hardships, such a journey must have been a panorama of delightful novelty. Life was not a crushing routine for Lincoln, but rather an adventure to be cherished and relived as one would in a great escapade. Admitting that the journey was possibly a hard and sad one for Thomas and Nancy Lincoln, Tarbell cleansed it for the young Lincoln by calling it a wonderful voyage into the unknown. It was 1922 when Eichelhardt and Tarbell first began to correspond. Although Tarbell had visited Evansville in January of 1920 to speak on the making of the world. Unsure what to make of Tarbell, the Evansville Courier noted that while staying at the McCurdy Hotel, she wanted to have her fingernails done. Although Miss Tarbell was built on the direct masculine lines with a muscular vigor and directness of speech, she is feminine enough to want well groomed nails, the paper reported. Tarbell told the paper's writers it's just impossible to keep one's nails clean on the train. So she was forced to get mended and repaired for an hour this morning. The paper described Tarbell as a big one tall and tame. Although she was decidedly feminine in her gracious manner and in the gentle sympathetic expression of the blue-gray eyes that spreads all over the features of her strong face as she talks earnestly and forcefully in the language of a statesman. Tarbell planned to return to the region later that summer to do research on the book that would become the Boy Scouts Life of Lincoln. She returned to Spencer County in southwestern Indiana in 1922, working on In the Footsteps of the Lincolns. And while she didn't see Idleheart, Tarbell began to correspond with them as she made her way to central Illinois. She wanted to know if it would be worth her time to come back to Evansville to speak with Idleheart. In a four-page letter, and it should be noted that Idleheart found it often hard to write anything less than a four or five, and sometimes even a ten-page letter. He said he didn't think that it would be necessary for a special trip. Tarbell told Eichelhardt that she wanted fairness for the residents of Indiana. I do not believe that Lincoln can be understood without understanding better than I do at least southwestern Indiana, Tarbell told Eichelhardt. What the country was, what its people thought and did, I am convinced that it had a deep influence on the young Lincoln. <laughs> I feel that in my previous Lincoln work, I was much too interested in picking out the facts and incidents which could be directly connected with Lincoln, that I have not sufficiently studied his intellectual and moral and social environment, particularly in the years that he was in your part of the country. After her travels through the region, including more time spent in southern Indiana than all her other trips combined, Tarbell gave her her most mature interpretation in that book, in the footsteps of the Lincolns. In it, she praised the work of Idle Hart and the Southwestern Indiana Historical Society. Judge Idle Hart's work gives us a better basis for judging of the caliber of the men under whose indirect influence at least Lincoln certainly came at this time than we have ever had before. He has developed with a wealth of detail the character of the English settlement which started in 1817 north of Evansville and 25 or 30 miles west of where we live. A settlement whose descendants are still among the leading people of the nation. Tarbell and Idlehard <coughs> in 
continued to correspond until Agnes Hart's death in 1934. In the last letter she wrote to him, Tyler Brown summed up her personal feelings for him, and more importantly, what he meant to the history of southwestern Indiana and her work on Lincoln. You have led that organization to make what I consider an invaluable contribution to our knowledge of the conditions under under which the boy Lincoln lived. You have proved that in spite of all the poverty and the hardships, and there's no doubt there was plenty of that, there were what we speak of as cultural influences. Eichelhardt had shown there were people in the area who had not only had personal libraries, but read and discussed books as in any intellectual salon. They had ambitions. They were alive to the influences which flowed in from in so many different directions. Lincoln was more or less directly touched by these people. We cannot and should not try to explain his youth without giving him full value to what, or excuse me, without giving full value to what you and your friends in southwestern Indiana have presented. I want to spend the rest of my time tonight discussing the barriers that Eichelhardt had to overcome, or more specifically, the one barrier that bedeviled Eichelhardt and the Southwestern Indiana Historical Society for a number of years, and was a direct enemy of local history, both in theory and practice. To students of Lincoln, the name of Indiana Senator Albert J. Beveridge is well known. Had he not suddenly and shockingly died in 1927, Beveridge might well have been known as the best Lincoln biographer of his time. The two volumes that he finished before his death, taking Lincoln up to his debates with Stephen A. Douglas, were lauded when they finally appeared, finished by the Boston-based historian Worthington C. Ford, among others. Beveridge had no respect for Idleheart, and Idleheart found in Beveridge the devil incarnate. Initially, however, when Eichelhardt heard that Beveridge had planned to write a biography of Lincoln along the lines of his Pulitzer Prize winning biography of John Marshall, he was elated. For my part, I hailed his entrance into the historical field. It has been lonesome down here to not to have some man of vision from the outside who was able to sit with us and aid us in this work. Eichelhardt's hatred of Beveridge stemmed mainly from the senator's refusal to accept that what the Southwestern Indiana Historical Society was doing qualified as a legitimate historical inquiry. Beveridge, who believed that the work of the historian had no room for the amateur, dismissed the group's work as antiquarianism. Beveridge lectured at Southwestern Indiana uh, Spencer County Vice President Bess Ehrman, who had sent him a paper on the work of the Lincoln Inquiry. I am writing exclusively from sources, Beverly Drew. As you know, modern scholarship sternly rejects secondary material and has nothing to do with inference, deduction, and supposition. In Beveridge's mind, the historian simply presented the facts gleaned from archival or documentary sources. The conclusion then rose naturally like a river after a torrential rain. Beveridge refused to acknowledge that he was choosing, that by choosing which facts to emphasize and what sources to use, he was categorizing as much as any other writer. After first praising his entry into the field of Lincoln biography, Eichelhardt later termed Beveridge's arrival as an invasion. Eichelhardt never missed an opportunity to excoriate Beveridge or his work either before or after the senator's death in 1927. In what he described as my last interview with him, Idlehart reportedly told Beveridge, you have smothered your hero in the filth of the scum of the earth. Acknowledging Beveridge's influence with several members of the historical community, Idlehart uh, alleged that due to Beveridge's low ideal of the body of people of Southern Indiana, that a number of historians declined to cooperate with According to Idlehart, Beveridge thought more of William E. Dodd than any other figure in the historical world. Dodd, however, allegedly told Idlehart that he had declined to read Beveridge's chapters in manuscript 
given Beveridge's point of view on the Indiana years of Lincoln. It must be noted that there is nothing in either the Dodd Beveridge correspondence or the Eichelhart Dodd correspondence that proves that. Dodd told Beveridge in August of 1926 that he could not read Beveridge's manuscript because he was swamped with master's theses and doctoral dissertations that had to be read and graded in a few weeks. Eichelhart alleged that before Beveridge's death, the senator had agreed to make certain corrections, both definite and indefinite, in their nature to his chapters. But Eichelhart never had the opportunity to talk with Beveridge to make sure the changes had been made. With a tremendous understatement, and I love this quote, Eichelhart noted that Beveridge preferred to talk to people who did not antagonize him. <laughs> Eichelhart's most volatile allegation against Beveridge was his insistence that when he met the senator in Newburgh, Indiana in the summer of 1924, at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning, Beveridge was drunk. He was to some extent under the influence of liquor, indicated not only by his excited manner, indicated in part by his nervous jumping around and seizing me by both shoulders time and time again to impress me with his sincerity but by the glossy film in his eyes and the fierce odor of bad whiskey on his breath, which was so offensive to me, taken altogether, that my, my mood was not cooperative. Even Beveridge's biographer, Claude Bowers, noted that when he was studying law, Beveridge began to drink. Although given the book, that the book was closely watched over by Beveridge's widow, he was quick to claim that Beveridge never drank to excess. It should be noted that the only witness for this alleged behavior was Eichelhart, who obviously cannot be said to be an unbiased source. <laughs> Beginning in uh, September of 1933, Eichelhart's health began to decline. In and out of the hospital for the next six months, Eichelhart finally succumbed to pneumonia on April 4th of 1934 at the age of 85. He lay in state in his son's home at 857 East Gum Street, where his funeral was held. He is buried in Oak Hill Cemetery. The Evansville Press praised Eichelhart in an editorial that ran nearly two weeks after his death. The paper noted that to the last, his was a strong mind and a sound body. He was a man who knew himself. He was thorough and formed positive conclusions on everything he undertook. For some reason, the editorialist chose to mention Eichelhart's love of gardening before his historical work. But he did note, through his studies in early Indiana history and in the life of Abraham Lincoln and his writings on those subjects, Mr. Eichelhart became a valued contributor of facts to the history of this state and the nation. Just how successful Eichelhart and the Southwestern Indiana Historical Society were and promoting local history is difficult to assess. If one measures success by lasting accomplishments, then they can hardly be judged triumphant. Yet, by simply raising the, an objection to the prejudiced view presented by other writers and being adamant in their full-throated defense of their position, they were able to add a missing voice to the discussion. Even if today that voice is at best diminished, or at worst, silence. The battle for local history continues to this day. While it may never meet the requirements of academic historians, for those who, like Eichelhart, are lured into its environment, that shouldn't matter. Just as genealogical study can and does stand on its own merits as a discipline, so too does local history stand or fall on its own accord. To quote the journalist Lewis Mumford, Every great event sweeps over the country like a wave, but it leaves its deposit behind in the life of the locality. And meanwhile, that life goes on with its own special history, its own special interest. Local history is immediate and accessible. Therefore, it holds a special meaning to both the young and old of a community. As Mumford noted, Local history is the perfect subject to bring alive the study of the past to young people. 
Because the things we can see and touch breathe life into history, which in turn breathes life into the community. While one would do well to understand, as Mumford did, that local history is not a means to excite false pride, when properly used, it can bring the community together, not only in the present, but in the years to come. A good past is definitely a guarantee of a good future. Thank you. said he was the only man that I could spend five years with and never be 